Good morning, everyone. It is great to be here. So we're starting a little bit late this morning. Um, a few announcements this morning. Um, Tuesday prayer. We've been having Tuesday prayer for quite some time now, and we have it 6, 6.30 uh, here at the church. But last week, we actually had it at my house, and I think we're going to do that again. And so we'll have Tuesday prayer. Um, still, you can come at 6 o'clock. We start praying normally by 6.30, and that will be at 296 Main Street. Um, we have tea and coffee if you want, uh, decaf, certainly, for that late at night. And Anyway, so come out to that, and uh, we just had a great time last week with that. Um, Saturday, November 26, which is next Saturday, uh, we have the town parade. And as we've been doing for the last couple of years, we'll also hand out hot chocolate at that. So we'll, uh, the parade starts at 6, and so I figure if we're here by 4 o'clock, for those who want to help out, we'll uh, get the hot chocolate all prepped and get our tables set up on the streets down there, and uh, away we'll go for that. So that's this coming Saturday. We'll meet at the church around 4 p.m. And certainly those of you who have young kids, bring your kids because they can play in the gym and test our hot chocolate and make sure it's good. And, and I know uh, some of the other kids that normally come enjoy handing out the hot chocolate during the parade. So. Is there a special um, name for that? Or what is it? Special? It's a Christmas parade. Okay. It's the town of Berwick this Christmas. Saturday? This Saturday, yep. This Saturday? Yep. Yep, on the 26th. Um, Sunday, November 27th, so that uh, just following this coming Saturday, at 2 p.m., the men of St. Anthony are having a music concert for the food bank. So you can go to that. That is held at the Catholic Church here in Berwick. Um, and, and also in a likewise manner, um, on December 11th, we'll be having our kind of food bank concert that we did last year, which was really organized by uh, Chris Palmer. And so we have a few acts set up for that. And I believe Paul Grimm and his quartet will be a part of it. And I believe Rhonda and Ruth will be doing a duet. And there'll be some really good music for that. So that will be December 11th at 2 p.m. Also, uh, one of the last announcements I'll make is that we did have the funeral for Eleanor yesterday. And for those of you who knew her, she really loved owls. And she had a great collection of owl figurines. And some of them are still left at the back of the church or d down in the, by the front doors. So if you want to take one in uh, memory of her, uh, the family would encourage you to do so. And finally, today, I do believe, is Rhonda's birthday. And so we'll sing happy birthday for her. And I'm told she's 51. That's what I've been told. So we'll go, we'll go with that. Let's sing happy birthday for her. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Rhonda, happy birthday to you, and many more, yes, all right. So, let the record show, 51 years old, that's great. All right, so with that, uh, allow me to call us to worship this morning. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 150. And the psalmist wrote these words. He said, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. And praise him for his surpassing greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And let's praise the Lord. So let me open us in prayer this morning. Our dear Lord, we thank you that uh, we're all able to gather here, Lord, both in person and online to worship you. God, we ask that as we spend the next hour together, Father, that you would give us words of encouragement, Lord, that you would give us words of comfort. God, that in the songs we sing, that our hearts may just rest easy, knowing that you died for us. Father, as we have gathered here with many thoughts and distractions and, and from different walks of life this morning and perhaps a bit of chaos. God, we just ask that your spirit would help us uh, rest in peace this morning as we have come to worship you. Lord, as we have come to lift up one another, and Lord, that we have come to lift up your name. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we'll sing our first two opening songs now, Blessed Be Your Name, 
and I sing the mighty power of God. And I'll say that again for our tech crew back there because I put the wrong song in. I sing the mighty power of God. All right, so let's sing these songs. I invite you to stand with us. i 
I'll just offer a quick word of prayer for the children, and then they can go down to Sunday school. So let's pray. Our dear great God, we thank you for the children in our midst here today. Lord, we think of those children who may normally be here but are not this day, and we ask that you would bless them, Lord, and that you would bless their parents. Father, we ask that you would go before them as they go downstairs for Sunday school. Lord, that they may learn more about you and come to know you more. And Father, that you would certainly be with the Sunday school teacher this morning. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so the kids can go downstairs for Sunday school. Our first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 46, and this is a fairly well-known psalm. And there's certainly one line here that I think most Christians would be familiar with, where it says, Be still and know that I am God. And so this is the psalm that the psalmist wrote. It says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will exalt, be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. At this time, we will have our pastoral prayer, and it's my privilege to offer that. Um, as many of you would know, there are quite a few things to pray about. Certainly, we'll be praying for those who have recently lost loved ones. And we will be praying for those who are finding it cold in the evenings. We will find, uh, pray for those who are still ill, either with COVID or other illnesses. And there is much more. There are a few people here who have asked for prayer for their parents and specifically their mothers. And so we'll be lifting up mothers as well today. So with a few of those items in mind, let's go to God in prayer once again this morning. Let's pray. Our dear Lord, we ask that you come and still our heart just now. Father, as we sit here, we ask that may we may be still and know that you are God. Father, as we lift up our voices together in thought, we come before you, Lord, with many requests. But Father, we do come first recognizing the blessings you have given us. We come recognizing, Lord, that you are our God. 
And Father, despite whether things are happening in this life that we like or not, that you are sovereign. Father, we are mindful this morning of what you call us to be. And Lord, you call us to be something that you made us, a new creation in you. Father, you demand of us that as we have received much grace, that we would pour that grace out as well. And so, Father, we ask for your help in this matter, that as we go through our days, Lord, that we may be grace-giving people, that our cups may overflow with your love, with your peace, with your mercy, that we may share it with those whom we come across. Father, we ask that you would help us in the depths of our heart to forgive others as you have forgiven us. Dear Lord, if there is anyone here who is like me this morning, then we find it difficult to forgive. And so God, we ask that you would help us with this. God, this morning we are certainly mindful of those who have recently lost loved ones. Father, we think of Randy and Sheila and Nakia. Father, the family of Eleanor. And God, we still remember Carla and Stephen, who lost Carla's father, Brian, not too long ago. Lord, the family of Amanda Whitman, and Father, the list goes on. <clears throat> These are people, Lord, who were known and cherished by this church, by the people sitting here. And so, Father, we ask for comfort. We ask for comfort for ourselves, for the families. And we ask, Lord, that you would remind us that these people have passed from this life into the everlasting care of your hands. Dear God, as the weather gets colder and prices of oil and electricity continue to rise, Father, we ask that um, you would be especially mindful of those who have a hard time heating their homes. Lord, of those who have a hard time finding homes, and God, we do ask that you would help us not just to um, righteously have these prayers and concerns, but Lord, that you would help us to act where we are able to act. Lord, that you would help us serve as a church where we are able to serve. Father, that we would be wise <clears throat> and discerning in how we help and where we help. But Father, nonetheless, that you would move it in our hearts that action follows prayer. Our dear Father, we also lift up to you those who are still ill and perhaps having lasting effects of COVID. And Father, those who are concerned for the other different viruses that are around. We ask God that you would keep us safe, Lord, that you would bless this town and the surrounding areas, that you would keep us safe. Father, we think of the kids who are in school, Lord, any children who are in daycare, those who work or find themselves in high traffic areas, Father, we ask that you would protect them. And dear Lord, we are still mindful of what is taking place in Ukraine and perhaps even Poland. And Father, we, we sit and stand before you this morning asking for you to intercede in that. Lord, that you would, um, Father, that you would tangibly change what is taking place. As Psalm 46 read, Lord, you are the God who ceases wars, who burns the shields and breaks the spears. And so, Father, we ask that what is written in your word would be manifest today. Lord, that all wars would come to an end, but Lord, we do think specifically of what's taking place in Ukraine now, as it is close to home, with the many Ukrainians who have come to Canada. Father, with these things in mind, we ask that you would bless everyone here this coming week. Father, that you would not allow us to just go on autopilot and, and guide through our week without diving into your word or spending time in prayer with you. And Father, we ask that as we request this thing, that it would not be a great burden to us, Lord, but that we would that we would desire these things 
with an ease in our heart. Father, that they would not be tasks just to be completed, but Lord, a way <clears throat> to come and search and find peace within you. Father, we ask that you would bless our families this morning. And God, that as we gear up for the Christmas season, that whatever that has in store for us, Lord, that we would keep our eyes fixed upon you. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now Rhonda and I will sing a, a reflection piece for us this morning. This one's called Hymn of Heaven. It's new, fairly new to both of us, and I think it will be new to you. It's uh, written and sung by a man named Phil Wickham, who's quite a uh, prominent contemporary Christian uh, music artist. And so this is called Hymn of Heaven.
At this time, I will invite the one and only Ariel Conrad to come forth and read our scripture for us. Finally. Luke 23, 32 to 43. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were, hang who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Thank you, Ariel. So our passage this morning is a little bit different than the book of Ezra, and it's also a little different than uh, what we'll be going over in the next coming weeks through this season of Advent. And so what I did, I went with the lectionary reading of the, uh, the calendar year uh, for the church, and this was the gospel reading for this morning. And this morning, for those of you who may know, is considered Christ the King Sunday, and it is the last Sunday before the season of Advent. And so we get a sense of this kingship of Christ just with this plaque that was written above the cross that said, this is the King of the Jews. And so our passage this morning starts out with, um, well, it starts out with the travel of Jesus from the temple and the courts where he was interrogated. And it takes us all the way up to the place called the Skull. And the place called the Skull is really just a hill outside the walls of Jerusalem. Scholars and archaeologists right now are a little unsure of which hill it was because there are several, several options. Uh, one of the most likely options actually right now has a... Uh, um, a temple built upon it, and the, the hill has been removed totally, which makes it that much more difficult to really discern where it was exactly. But this place, which is called the Skull, as you may be aware, is also often referred to as the Hill of Calvary. 
And this term is the English term, which is based off the Latin term calvaria, which is really a Vulgate's Latin translation of the Greek word cranium, which means skull. And for those who were itching to know that, there you go. You know that now. Um, and we also see in the, in the scripture that it's also often referred to as a Golgotha. And this is simply the Aramaic word that means the same thing. And the reason this place was called the skull, as best as um, biblical interpreters can figure out, is that this, the hill itself was shaped like a skull. It actually did not have to do with the fact that often crucifixions took place there, but simply that the shape of the hill itself was that of a skull. In our passage this morning, there is lots going on, and I think there's lots that we could draw from and focus on. Um, one of the very first things that I'm sure stuck out to us is that as Jesus is placed on this cross, and as the soldiers and those who placed him there are casting lots, he has this famous last words from the cross, which says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And within this line alone, there is more truth than I think we could spend several weeks um, talking about. That while Jesus is on the cross dying for us, his enemies are casting lots for his clothes. He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And this has been on my mind quite a bit this week as I was preparing for this passage. And I've been considering how, as I prayed in the pastoral prayer, it is very difficult often for us to forgive others. And what we often, I think, forget with forgiveness is that it always is necessary when a wrong has been done. It is easy for us, perhaps this morning, as we've, we've gathered together in church, um, we've perhaps put on our Sunday best, unless you're me, and we've gathered here in the name of Christ, and we've sung some songs, and, and we really, you know, we're de redevoting our, our lives to Christ this morning in, in a sense. And it may be easy for us to say, yes, I want to forgive as Christ did. But as soon as we get out from these walls and someone perhaps intentionally harms or hurts or insults us, that's when forgiveness becomes difficult. But ironically, that is when it is needed most. And I've been reflecting on this quite a bit and considering how Jesus was in such a position that you would think forgiveness would be near impossible. One thing to point out with this is that through the Gospels, there are many accounts of Jesus healing and doing miracles, and he forgives people of their sins, and he offers forgiveness, and that's one of the main issues that arises with some of the Pharisees. They say, who can forgive sin but God alone? And while this has been something that took place throughout the Gospels as we've read them, Jesus here, as he's on the cross, doesn't offer forgiveness to these people. He doesn't say your sins are forgiven, but rather he intercedes for them to the Father and says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And so as we consider forgiveness in our own lives and the forgiveness that is shown here in this passage, um, we should be reminded that Christ, who we've come to worship this morning, is a God who intercedes, not just for us, but he intercedes for his enemies. For those who are outside the kingdom of God, for those who wish ill against him, Jesus intercedes for them, on behalf of them, and asks that God the Father would forgive them. As we move on through the passage, verse 35 says, the people stood watching. And I was surprised because this seems like a fairly um, uneventful line in our passage this morning. The people stood watching. But many commentators made quite a fuss about this line, and they had much to say about these people, what they were doing, who they were, and the like. These people have, throughout the Gospels, 
had a rocky relationship with Jesus. The great crowds have both gathered around him, seeking healing, seeking teaching, seeking miracles, seeking forgiveness. And at the same time, the crowds have often gathered around him in fear, saying, depart from this place. We can think of the passage where he heals a demoniac. And the town says, leave this place further fearful of the power that he has. And certainly, just prior to this scripture that we read this morning, as we know, there is the great triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And one of the main images we have um, from this event is the crowds, the people gathered at the entrance of Jerusalem, laying down palm branches, shouting Hosanna, and they are there with Jesus. And then, as we move on in that narrative, we find that when Pilate brings Jesus before the great crowd, they yell the exact opposite. They yell, crucify him. So the people in verse 35 have quite a history with Jesus. It is both a positive history and a negative history. And not only this, but the commentators make a big uh, fuss out of this word, stood watching. When we look at the Greek word used here, when it's used throughout the Gospels, particularly in the Gospel of Luke, it's often referred not just to simply standing and observing, but rather understanding what is taking place to watch, to watch and observe and to understand. And so the people stood watching, the people with mixed hearts, the people with mixed histories with Jesus stood watching. As Christ was on the cross, they stood there helpless, understanding what was taking place. And this is contrasted as we move along through our scripture. Immediately after the people stood watching, it says, and the rulers even sneered at him. And this is one of three instances that we read in this short um, pericope of what is taking place against Jesus. So it says that the rulers even sneered at him, and they said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. And then we read that the soldiers also came and mocked him, and they offered him wine vinegar, and they said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And a little bit further, it says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. These are three accounts where one involves the ruler sneering, one involves the soldiers mocking, and the third involves this condemned criminal hurling insults. But within these attacks also come a test of Jesus, an advance against him. In each reference, these different parties say, save yourself. If you are who you say you are, save yourself. And we must be reminded as we read through this passage of the temptation of Jesus that took place in the desert. Three times he was tempted. And at the same time, and that was just at the beginning of his ministry, he had just been baptized, the Holy Spirit had descended upon him like a dove, and he's led out into the wilderness where he is tempted. And in his last hours on this earth, as he hung on the cross, certainly in agony, which is the least likely of his worries at this point, he again is tempted three times. If you are the king of the Jews, if you are the chosen one, if you are who you say you are, save yourself. And now, during this, these three attacks, it is good to notice that Jesus remains silent throughout them. After the leaders sneer to one another and challenge him, nothing is said. After the soldiers mock him and say, save yourself, nothing is said. And finally, once that first criminal says, aren't you the Messiah, save yourself and us, nothing is said. But it is only once that second criminal who says we are punished justly 
forgetting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Only then does Jesus find the need to speak up. And he responds to this criminal by saying, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This paradise that is spoken of can be referred to as a few different things. Originally, it was a Persian word that was used, and it was meant as a, a place of solitude, a garden, an enclosed uh, place with vegetation, a peaceful place, a walled, protected garden. And we even read that throughout the Old Testament, um, the, the Garden of Eden, the same word is used, paradisius, in Greek. The Septuagint translates that first Genesis book with that word. And so this paradise that Jesus refers to is, I would say, up for debate. Does it mean heaven? Does it mean the bosom of Abraham? Does it mean just a place of resting that the righteous go prior to the resurrection? That is up for debate, but what is not up for debate is that Jesus promises this repentant criminal, condemned, guilty, repented criminal, that he will be with him that day in paradise. One commentator says, that there is no more reassuring divine promise than that of you will be with me. Being with is a constant of biblical fidelity. Whether it is in God's presence or in his own or the people in the company of their Lord. This Emmanuel God with us. And Luke, the evangelist who wrote this gospel that we are reading from today, treasures these expressions and makes use of them. In Jesus' last moments on the cross, he takes time to look towards the repentant criminal and say, today you will be with me. Now, one of the most traditional um, ways to approach this text is really the way that it's set up for us. We have Jesus in the middle, and we have a criminal on the left and a criminal on the right, one of which responds poorly to Christ and one of which responds positively. And so in our passage, there is certainly an invitation to us to consider how we engage with Christ, whether we are like the first criminal or the second. And going off again, what another commentator suggested, what I think is really valuable to, to look at and consider from this imagery of where we stand is to have that in mind as we consider that Christ, who often is the one making comments, who is often the one organizing the situation and handling things, that Christ remains silent while the opinions and thoughts of those around him are thrown at him. And so, again, with this image of the positive criminal on the right and the negative criminal on the left, lined together with the fact that it, at the moment on the cross, it is not really Christ's opinion of us that is in question, but rather our opinion of him. Christ is silent while those people sneer and mock and insult him. But when it comes to a criminal, who in his last moments repents, who affirms that he is sinful and affirms that Jesus has uh, been the one who has done nothing wrong. It's at that moment that Jesus responds. One thing to make note of with these criminals, I think it's easy, at least it's easy for me, to read this narrative and start to have a soft heart for who these men were. Um, I think I'm probably influenced by the movie Aladdin more than I think, because when I think of a thief and a criminal, I think of someone who's just stealing bread to feed their family and monkey or something. 
But what is taking place here, the words used to, to describe these criminals, um, I've used the word thief several times here, but really what they were was robbers who were part of a band of robbers. When we think of the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we have this Jew walking this road, and there's a band of robbers who come out and beat him to an inch of life of death, and they take all of his stuff, and they leave him there helpless. This is the type of criminal that we're talking about. Both of these criminals fit that description. Um, some commentators suggest that there is good reason to think that these were criminals who were really part of this organized, violent behavior of attacking people when they were vulnerable. And really, this is the type of actions that the Romans kept crucifixion for, the worst of the worst. And so it paints a little bit of a different light as we look at Jesus on the cross in this, this one criminal who, for as good as we can tell, hasn't known Jesus that long, and just repents simply. And Jesus says, today you will be in paradise. There is something profound of forgiveness and mercy that takes place there that I think I have a hard time understanding, um, let alone trying to articulate to you sitting here. And when we understand, not understand, but when we consider that, especially against, um, alongside with this prayer that he th quickly throws up about those who have essentially killed him, where he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. It is hard to come away from this scripture with any other theme or thought than one of the most deep, sincere forgiveness, mercy, and grace. <clears throat> A grace that surpasses certainly my understanding, and perhaps it surpasses yours as well. There is a mercy and grace and a forgiveness that is displayed here, not to the, the women who have followed him up and who are crying at his feet, but to those who are deserving of condemnation, those who have likely killed before, those who are in the act of killing and casting lots for the clothing. These are the type of people that Jesus has come to forgive. And now one thing I think that the enemy often does is he will, um, he will definitely make us second guess our own nature, our own worthiness, our own ability to receive forgiveness, mercy, grace, peace, whatever you want to call it. I'm sure that everyone sitting here and standing here this morning has thought more than once that you're unworthy that you're not that great. You've thought more than once that you'd like to do better, but you can't. Or maybe that you don't even want to do better, but you wish that you did want to do better. That how could Christ forgive you? Perhaps you've neglected God for the last 60 years of your life. And you sit here wondering, how in, how in God's name could I come before him now? will take heart in the narrative that we've read this morning. That even in the 11th hour of a murderer hung on a cross, condemned for his crimes and his sin, Jesus has forgiveness. That even in the 11th hour of his own life, he has forgiveness for those who are in the act of killing him. This is the God that we have come to worship this morning. And this is the God who has died for us. There is an irony that takes place in these three um, attempts at testing Jesus. This continued, save yourself. He saved others, let him save himself. And certainly in this last test by the criminal saying, save yourself and save us. The irony is that Christ on the cross is the act of saving everyone. These rulers sneered and said he saved others, yet he can't save himself. But they had it so wrong. 
It is in his act on the cross that he is saving others. The soldiers who say, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. To be the king of the Jews, to save yourself, would be to let others perish. Jesus is fulfilling the Father's will. He's fulfilling the atonement of sin that all of us need. It is a great irony that takes place. And this irony, as I was contemplating um, just last night, as I was trying to finish up some, some preparation, the irony, I think, finds itself into our own life. And I'll certainly speak from my own experience. It finds, it finds truth in my life where often I will be displeased with what God is doing. I'll be displeased with what he's doing perhaps in my life or in the life of others or anything in general. And my lament to God could perhaps in some ways be reworded to say, Lord, save us. Lord, save me. Lord, act to do something. And that is the exact request that these three different groups of people had for him. They miss what is taking place and call upon God to act even though he's in the midst of one of the most crucial acts in human history. And so I'll encourage you to just consider as you contemplate where you are happy with God or where you are unhappy with him, are you missing the act that he is in the midst of doing? Now, while a lot of this, uh, this sermon so far, drawing from this passage, really points to this grace, this mercy, this forgiveness, I think it's fair to say that that is not necessarily the whole story of what takes place. One thing we must remember in the exchange between the second criminal and Jesus is that there is, as far as we can tell, a repentance that takes place. There is, as far as we can tell, a confession of sin that takes place. And again, it's after these confessions that Jesus responds, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so we have a difficult task really before us to make sense of grace and forgiveness that is given, and yet a sort of requirement on our part. And I think for this morning, the best I can put it is this. Is that while grace and forgiveness are given freely, we must receive them. Consider Christ when he makes his prayer to God for the soldiers. Forgiveness is given. And I think that is true. Um, I think that is true perhaps even more just than for the Christian or those who have come to Christ. I think Christ came to forgive. And Christ also came to give grace. But the catch is that grace does not mean salvation. And forgiveness does not mean salvation restored relationship. If we consider how when we try to forgive others and we try to act that forgiveness in the means of giving grace, all we have done is restored our half of that relationship, our half of that hurt. When we forgive others, it doesn't change their actions. It doesn't change their outlook. When we extend grace to others, it often doesn't change their words or their habits or anything like that. And while we may freely give grace and give forgiveness as Christ did, again, it does not mean a restored relationship with those individuals. And I think that's the best that I can point to this paradox of us Christians here receiving free grace and receiving free forgiveness while also having a responsibility on ourselves or of ourselves 
to respond to this grace and forgiveness. And I think that is what this criminal does. He picks up on the grace and forgiveness that is there. One thing I tried to find in some of the commentaries and other monographs um, regarding the nature of this passage and this narrative um, was what, what took place before this with those criminals and Jesus. Our passage this morning began in, uh, in verse 32. It says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And that's really all it tells us. But I can't help but think or imagine or assume that prior to being led out, these criminals must have spent a little bit of time together. You would think they'd be in the same holding cell, chained up together nearby. And if that is the case, I can only imagine what conversation, if any, took place. Because when we look towards the end of this passage and we think, well, we have this one criminal who doesn't know Jesus and hurls insults at him, and this other criminal who seemingly doesn't know Jesus either but responds positively to him, I just wonder what conversations took place before that. I can almost imagine that the same type of interrogation that was given by Pilate and uh, um, the lead Jewish leader, that that same type of interpretation was given by these criminals. And that's why we see that when they are finally on the cross, one says, aren't you the Messiah? You've been telling me for the last however long. You are the Messiah. Save yourself, save us. This first criminal is not enjoying what Christ is doing, does not understand what Christ is doing, while the second one does. One other interesting fact to point out as we consider how perhaps these criminals didn't know Jesus very well, there are very few times through, it just there's a handful of times when you look at all four gospels that you have exchanges between Jesus and someone else where they refer to Jesus by his name, Jesus. It's often either Lord, Christ, Son of God. Um, and in fact, it's often actually um, demons who say Jesus, Son of God. And so it's a very peculiar thing in our gospels when we see someone talking to Christ and referring to him by his first name. And yet, this is what the second criminal does. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And again, for me, um, what this means that I would like to tell you this morning is that while Christ desires our dedication to him our whole life, he requires and just our devotion to him, it takes very little time when we decide to do that, to get to know him, to be able to call him by his first name and have him respond that today you will be with him in paradise. Finally, I'll leave us with just this uh, perspective Throughout the Gospels, Christ exercised great authority. He exercised it in his handling of conversations in different um, circumstances. He exercised it certainly when he performed miracles, forgave sin, when he drove out demons. Throughout the Gospels, throughout Christ's ministry, he exercised great authority. And while in our passage this morning, we have a much more meek, uh, looking at Jesus, who's on the cross, who's more or less silent, who's taking insult after insult, test after test, we may be tempted to say that this is a weakened Jesus. But certainly, as one commentator pointed out, he says, Jesus' authority nevertheless exists, but it is consistent with service and transcends death. And so as we tie this into forgiveness and tie this into mercy, the mercy that we've received, that Christ gives, that we've 
seen in this narrative that we are to give to others. There is a point for us to be active in service. And that our service, our servicing one another, our humbling of ourselves, is an act of responding to Jesus' authority and following in his footsteps. That the Jesus who died on the cross and saw his clothes right before his eyes taken and cast lots for, that Jesus is the one who has authority over all things. And that is the one who we give our lives to. This is the one who we are called little Christians, little Christs, Christians. This is the one who we look up to. This is the one whom died for us. And so as we prepare for the Advent season, which is certainly a joyous time of Christ coming and us getting to celebrate God incarnate, Emmanuel, we can prepare for that as we consider how Christ amidst our snow and our Christmas songs and all those joyous things, the family gatherings, that Christ came to serve. And not just to serve when he was able, when he was willing, when it worked for him, but he came to serve to such the point that he died to save everyone sitting here. And I think that is a strong, strong a reflection to have as we enter into this Advent season. And I believe that if we reflect on it well, it will help augment our joy and our celebration of the Christmas season. And finally, our sin, again, is not what keeps us from God. Our problem often is our inability to respond to that love of God and to perhaps even repent like this criminal did. As it is not our sins that keep us from God, we can go from this place knowing that we are genuinely forgiven and that we are genuinely given grace beyond our understanding. And it is up to us what we do with that. Allow me to pray. Our dear Lord, we thank you very much for your word this morning. We thank you, God, for the account that Luke has for us in his gospel. Father, we ask that you would help us as we go from this place to, to really take heart of what you did on the cross, and Lord, even how you carried yourself during that time. Lord, we ask that you would help us to reflect often that while the soldiers who put you up on that wood sat and, and mocked you, Lord, that you prayed for forgiveness for them. Lord, that you didn't pray that they would change. Lord, that you didn't pray that they would come to know you. Lord, that you didn't pray that they would just get this sense and become good people. But Lord, you prayed that God, your Father, would forgive them. Lord, that you intercede for them. Let us reflect on that. And Father, let us please, let us reflect on the fact that even on the 11th hour, how late it was in this criminal's life, he looked to Christ and said, Jesus, remember me. And that Jesus' response was that he would. God, let us go from this place as we close our service here, um, just with the power of your spirit, with the joy of the good news, and Lord, certainly with the comfort of one another, that we have here today. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we'll sing our closing song, Abide With Me. I invite you to stand.
Dear Lord, we thank you for the gathering of your people here today. Lord, we thank you for the ability to worship in song and deed. And we thank you for your word, which you have given us. And finally, we thank you for your ever-sustaining grace. In Jesus' name, amen. And may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm, and may he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again the next time we gather to worship. Amen. And don't forget we have coffee and tea downstairs if you'd like to stay and enjoy some of that. <laughs>